Hey guys, welcome back to another weekly tech tip video. So on last week's video, Brett gave you a little glimpse in the Ceph dashboard when he was doing his tutorial. So for this week, what I thought we would do is go a lot more in depth on what the Ceph dashboard offers as far as administration, whether it be object, file system, or block, and then also some of the different metrics that you can see and manage from the dashboard as well. So let's head on over to my desk and we'll start right away. Okay, welcome to the Ceph dashboard tutorial. So as you can see, we have uh, the Ceph dashboard up. So this is what you're going to see uh, once you build your cluster if you have uh, your managers up and running. So as you can see, there's quite a few different metrics that you can get at a glance here. Uh, for, so first and foremost, you can take a look and see here that gives us a cluster status of the health of our cluster. And should anything at all happen, uh, you will get a warning here immediately. And also you get a little, uh, update as to where the issue is occurring and then you can go in and, and view your logs and try to figure out exactly what's wrong. So as you can see also you have things like your monitors, how many monitors you have in your cluster, also how many OSDs you have up. So OSDs for people that are new to Ceph, uh, you can imagine those as hard drives. It is possible to have more than one uh, hard drive or one, more than one OSD per hard drive but uh, it's very rare only in very very fast NVMe drives and things like that or for specific use cases. Uh, next we can see our manager daemons, uh, how many we have in active and standby. We view our iSCSI gateways, our metadata servers. So you only have metadata servers if you're running CephFS. Uh, we run them in active standby mode. Um, then you'll see your object gateways. And then hosts is how many hosts are part of this cluster, how many uh, actual servers are in this cluster and, and then if you actually click on it you'll see the different services that they run. Uh, but continuing on you get to see the client throughput and client IOPS so you get a nice little view at a glance of how much uh, work your cluster is doing right now on the client side and also you get a little recovery throughput uh, as well so if, if your dashboard or sorry if your cluster is uh, recovering if it's uh, recovering to parity if you lost a hard drive and it's uh, moving the data back through the cluster to to recover parity you will see that throughput here Then also you can see if there's any scrubs happening so um, when Ceph does a scrub what it does it compares with uh, other pieces of data the other replication of, of pieces of data in the cluster to ensure that there's no corruption or bit rot on, on your cluster or any parts of your cluster Finally, we come down here and we see how many pools this cluster has. We'll be going into that more in depth later. And then you can view the raw capacity, how many objects, and then just get a rough overview of placement groups of how many each OSD has, and then uh, the status of those placement groups as well. So let's move on. So we're going to come into the cluster tab here. And first and foremost, let's come in and look at hosts again. So what you're going to see here is a list of hosts that are part of your cluster. So OSDs are the actual storage servers themselves. And as you can see when you look in, um, servers can do more than one service. So you may have multiple services running on different, uh, different devices. So as you can see on the OSD nodes, uh, almost all of them are running the manager. Actually, all of them are running the manager service. And then for the monitor service, since we have a even number of OSDs, you can't have an even number of monitors because you want to have them in quorum and to be able to tie break if there's any debate over which cluster map is correct. So you will have an odd number. So as you can see, we have five in this one. And actually to that point, we can uh, come over and take a look at our monitors right here. So there's not much you can do in here, but you can just view what, uh, what nodes are using are running the monitor daemon and also if they're in quorum or not. Uh, so moving back to hosts, actually you can take a look here. This is uh, a nice view at a glance of some of the metrics that you're going to be able to see throughout this entire dashboard. Um, so the way that uh, Ceph gets its metrics in the dashboard like this is we use Prometheus to scrape the, the metrics and then Grafana to display them. So you'll see quite a few different uh, metrics throughout the entire dashboard. Okay, so moving, moving on here, we come to OSDs. So OSDs is going to show you all the hard drives in your cluster. Um, and you can also get a look at how much is being used for each drive, their size, and also you can see the read and write if there's any uh, I.O. activity happening on them at a given time. Then also if you want to do a scrub on a given uh, drive, you can use it and click on it and then go to scrub here. Uh, there's another really cool thing that you can do from here. So, for example, if you had to take one of your servers down for maintenance and it was a planned uh, outage, 
if you didn't want Ceph to begin healing itself uh, because the server is going to come back online eventually, what you can do is you can come in here and set some flags to stop uh, Ceph from healing. So you would set no recover, no backfill, no out. And essentially what it would do is it would stop Ceph from uh, trying to maintain parity, trying to move the missing data back around to, uh, to become uh, full again, to be back into parity. And then so once your maintenance window finishes, you'd be able to bring the server back online and then you would not have to uh, move all that data around once more. So it's a good thing to do from there. And then also what you can do here is set your recover priority. So this is definitely handy if you lose a few hard drives. You would be able to increase the priority of your recovery uh, if you want to maintain parity much quicker. Now it should be noted, obviously, if you have a lot of recovery to do, the higher you set this, uh, the more I.O. for your client side will be taken up. Okay, also we can uh, come over here and take a look at some more performance metrics. So this is a really nice one because you can see the different types of OSDs you have. So uh, the device class, if they're SSDs or mechanical drives. And you can also see which file store type, or sorry, which uh, CFS type you have, whether it's Blue Store or File Store. We're exclusively on Blue Store here at 45 drives. Then also you can see the different sizes of the drives as well, and then the distribution of placement groups. Uh, so the placement groups uh, have to do with the crush algorithm. If you're not familiar with Ceph, uh, it does not have centralized metadata like some other uh, clustered storage solutions. So what it does is it breaks the metadata out evenly throughout the entire cluster, and the placement groups are used uh, to ensure that, that, that the data is spread out throughout them. So ensuring a good uh, distribution of your placement groups is going to ensure uh, good performance across the entire cluster. All right, so moving on, uh, we also see some read and write latencies as well. Um, all right, so moving on to the next thing, let's take a look. Uh, we come to configuration. So configuration is where you're going to uh, be able to set many of the different tunables for your cluster. So there's lots of different things that you're going to be able to change here that uh, you no longer have to go into the command line to do. So for example, if you want to uh, list it by the different service that these are running, you can do it here. So you can set OSDs and you can view different uh, different metrics for each service, the manager uh, and monitors as well. So mon, memory, auto-tune, so auto-tuning how much memory cache is being used for OSD monitors, many things like that. Uh, you can come in here and do it from here. Next, moving on, we come to our crush map. So the crush map is essentially just a read-only view of the failure domain and the hierarchy of your cluster. It just gives you an overall view of how your cluster is laid out and which OSDs are in which uh, server or OSD server. You can also view the weight uh, associated with each OSD and which uh, type of device it is as well. Okay, moving on, we get to our manager modules. So really all we're going to see here for us is the dashboard. We can see that it is enabled because we're using it. And you can get an idea of uh, the metrics for the uh, you can get an idea for the metric server here and also you can take a look at the IP address and just some some info about your dashboard and also we see we've got our Grafana API URL here which uh, this is where we can go just to view all of our Grafana metrics all in one place rather than have it spread out through the different tabs in the actual dashboard this will allow you to see all the different metrics that you may want to see for your cluster Okay, so moving on, uh, all really that's left is we have our logs here. So this is definitely where you're going to go if you have any health warnings or if you go into an uh, unhealthy state, you can get some clues here in the logs. And then finally, we just come to our alerts and silences. So if you have any alerts, you will see them here and you'll be able to create a silence if you're working on it and you don't want it still yelling at you, you can create a silence here once it comes up. So next we come to our pools. So this is uh, the section where you'll see all the different pools created in the cluster. So many of these are going to be auto-created when you do different things. So for example, if you're doing the RGW gateways, you'll have uh, quite a few of these auto-created. And then the same with CephFS. So we have CephFS running here. So we have auto CephFS data and metadata is created. But also on top of that, if you want to create your own, uh, you want to create your own pools, you can come in here and click create and it's very very simple you just name your pool name the type of pool you want to use whether it be erasure coding or replicated and if you choose uh, replicated for example uh, you would change 
how many reps you would like to use and then if you do erasure coding you would set what type of erasure coding profile you would like to use so we have two plus one here and we also have the default um, so continuing in the pools bar here we can also get some more metrics we can view the top 15 client IOPS and top client throughput and then also an interesting cool thing that you can see here is you can see the top 15 pools that are used by capacity so which pools are they using the most data uh, which is nice to see sometimes Okay, continuing on, we're coming to block now. So let's first check images out. Okay, so here we are. Uh, this is a list of all the images that we've created thus far on this test cluster that we have here in the office. Uh, so essentially these are RBDs, which is how Ceph handles block devices. And you can create them from here. It's really quite simple. You just go into the create, give it a name, select which pool specifically you'd like to use. So for example, this is SSDs for us, and this is mechanical drives. Then you decide how big you want that pool to be, and then if you go into advanced, actually, you can set the object size for it. So depending on uh, what the use case for the image is, you will set this differently. So for example, for our ESXi host, uh, VMware uses one mag block sizes, so we typically use one mag when we do images for that. Um, but yes, it allows you to do uh, some advanced tuning for, of your own. Okay, so moving on, the next thing we're going to come to is mirroring. Uh, this is uh, essentially a way to do replication to multiple clusters. You can mirror your RBDs across multiple clusters here, but uh, we only have one cluster, so we don't have this set up. Next, finally, in block devices, we come to iSCSI. So this is where you get a view of all the gateways. So these are the different portals that we have set up currently for our cluster. And then you can see the images that are plugged into this cluster, or this uh, target right now. And now if we move over to targets and we click on our target that we have, you can actually get a good overview of the topology. So this is our target here, and these are the um, images that that target has to share out. And then if you go deeper, you can actually view which uh, images are connected to which initiator. So this would be my Windows machine in the office. Uh, this is our VMware test uh, host. And then this is just one more uh, Windows machine that we have in the office somewhere. And we have multiple different images connected to each one. So it's really nice to be able to view these uh, from the dashboard and so you get an overall view of where your block device is and where your iSCSI is being shared out to. Coming through next, what we're going to get to is NFS. So as you can see, we've got a few NFS exports here that we're, we're sharing for our VMware. Um, and you can edit them from here, but you can also create new ones from here as well. So let's come in and, and just go through that quickly. So first and foremost, you're going to pick uh, your NFS, the daemons that is going to be sharing out your NFS. So we're going to pick at least two at all times so we can do highly available. Um, you can either do active active or active passive so typically depending on the deployment that we do here well we'll do one or the other um, we haven't uh, for so for example if we're using nfs with vmware typically for us with ceph we, we like to use active passive because we haven't had great results uh, using active active with vmware uh, with ceph so then you continue on and you go to uh, cephfs as the back end so um, this is our only file system, so that's the only one you can choose here. And then you just uh, essentially continue on setting up your permissions the way that you want to have it set up. So we could do admin for this run and just continue on. So CephFS is the name. Uh, continuing on, uh, you can decide which protocol you want, and then you can give it its own tag. Uh, or not, you don't have to if you don't want to. And then also, obviously, this is where the mount point is that you're going to use. Then you're going to give them what type of access you would like that user to have, and then whether you want to set up root squashing or not. And then finally, you can set exactly which clients you want to be able to have access to this uh, NFS export. And that's as, as simple as it is. Once you create it out, it'll be ready to share for your users. Okay, so moving on, we get to file systems. So as you can see, we have our CephFS here, and it's actually really cool. So you can come down and you can take a look at the clients that are actually connected to your CephFS. So as you view, come through here, we can see whether they're connected via user space or if they're actually kernel mounting CephFS. And so we can view, like we have our NFS servers here that obviously have CephFS mounted, as that's how they share it out. And then as you can see here, we also have our Samba gateways as well that have CephFS kernel mounted on them. So essentially what happens here is um, 
when you're looking to use protocols like Samba or NFS or iSCSI, on top of the actual storage nodes themselves, what you'll have is what we call file system gateways. So those gateways will then either for iSCSI, they would act as the target for iSCSI, or when it comes to um, file system and using SMB or NFS, we would mount CephFS uh, via kernel mount on those machines, and then we would create the Samba shares on there. So these file system gateways actually have a direct connection into the cluster, and they are the point in which uh, you share your Samba from here. So as you can see, they're also mounting via kernel here. Okay, so moving to object gateway, actually this specific cluster uh, doesn't have any object gateway daemon set up, but I will be moving over to another cluster of ours and we can take a look. So as you can see here, uh, we're in object gateway and we're on daemon, so we can view here uh, the three servers that we're acting as our uh, object gateways. These are actually in this instance uh, co-located on the storage servers themselves. So as you can see we have OSD 1, 2, and 3 acting as our RGWs. So yeah, and the next thing that I'm going to show is actually we can go and see some more metrics here. So as you can see these are uh, really nice to be able to look at uh, to view how much data is getting put or getting get it from uh, your S3 buckets that you have set up here. So you can also get a look at your latencies, how much bandwidth you're using, and then also as you can see we are load balanced here so each OSD is uh, taking one third of the load which is exactly what you'd want it to do uh, which is nice to see. So this is a good spot to get some metrics for your uh, object gateways. Now we move into users so what we can do here is we can create users for our uh, buckets that we are going to create. Uh, very, very simple. You would come over into create, create your username, set up your full name, an email address if you'd want to, and then from here you can actually decide how many buckets you want this user to be able to create, and then if you want to give them an auto-generated key or if you give them a specific key with uh, that you want to create ahead of time, you can do that from here. Then also you can set some bucket and user quotas, uh, like how much data can be in, allowed in one specific bucket or how big of a file, specific things like that. And then moving finally, what we get to is our buckets. And it's again very, very simple to create buckets that can be shared, uh, fully compatible with the S3 protocol. Um, so we come in, we can set create and then all you really have to do is set the name that you want to give it and then which user you would like to be the owner and then you set create bucket and uh, the bucket is then created and then you can use many different things to access that bucket actually we've done a great video recently uh, that Brett did and I actually set up the screenshots for them is showing all the different ways that we can share out and, and access S3 buckets. So with any of the S3 buckets that you would create here, you'd be able to use S3 browser, Cyberduck, um, really anything that we talked about in that video would be able to communicate with these buckets that we would create here. All right, guys, well, hopefully you enjoyed uh, this walkthrough of the Ceph dashboard and everything it has to offer. Um, if you have any questions or comments about anything you've seen or anything you want to see further, definitely let me know. Uh, put it in the comments section, and uh, I'll be sure to address it and maybe even create a new video to go a little more in-depth. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that deeper dive into the Ceph dashboard. And if there's any specific thing that I went through in this video that you want to learn more about, just let us know in the comments, and I'll definitely create a, a video that goes into a more deep dive on something very specific. All right, so I guess we're at the fun fact time. Uh, Brett seems to be really good at these. Uh, mine aren't quite as funny, but uh, I thought I had a good one for Ceph at least. So Ceph's releases go in an alphabetical order. Right now we're on Nautilus. And the next one is coming up really soon, and that's going to be called Octopus. So that's a fun fact for you. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next Tech Tip.